In this video, we will review some hormones fundamental to human health and disease. We'll start with the hypothalamic pituitary axis, which regulates many of our hormones. Input into the hypothalamus will signal the release of a releasing hormone, such as corticotropin releasing hormone. This releasing hormone then travels to the anterior pituitary, signaling the release of a tropic hormone, such as adrenocorticotropic hormones. Tropic hormones then travel to the target organ, having its desired effect. We also have a posterior pituitary that works quite differently from the anterior pituitary. In the posterior pituitary, it receives hormones from the hypothalamus. This includes antidiuretic hormone, important in blood pressure regulation, which is made in the supraoptic nucleus, and oxytocin, which comes from the paraventricular nucleus. Let's start with thyroid gland and thyroid hormone. The thyroid is made of multiple follicles which are the functional units of the thyroid. Within each follicle is a colloidal area where thyroglobulin and iodide come together to make thyroid hormone. We have two types of thyroid hormones, T3, which is triiodothyronine, and T4, which is thyroxine. While T4 is the most abundant thyroid hormone in the blood, T3 is more potent. Thyroid hormone secretion is regulated through a hypothalamic pituitary thyroid negative feedback system. When levels of thyroid hormone are too low, this signals the release of thyroid releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. Thyroid releasing hormone then travels to the anterior pituitary, signaling the release of thyroid stimulating hormone. Thyroid stimulating hormone then travels to the thyroid, where it signals the thyroid follicle cells to release T3 and T4. When blood levels reach their physiologic need of T3 and T4, this then signals through negative feedback an inhibition of thyroid releasing hormone and thyroid stimulating hormone production, turning off this system. What is it that thyroid hormone does? The thyroid hormone primarily regulates our metabolism. An increase in thyroid hormone will increase our metabolic rate. This increases utilization of glucose, fat, and protein, and promotes weight loss from increased caloric expenditure. Because metabolism requires the use of oxygen, an increase in thyroid hormone will increase our cardiorespiratory demands. It also increases GI motility and appetite, and thyroid hormone increases our skeletal muscle tone and reflexes. On the posterior surface of our thyroid, we have our parathyroid glands. Parathyroid gland releases parathyroid hormone which functions to regulate blood calcium. When the blood calcium concentration gets too low, this signals the release of parathyroid hormone. The release of parathyroid hormone has three main effects. One, parathyroid hormone promotes the breakdown of bone. It inhibits osteoblast activity. Osteoblasts are the cells that build bone. It also stimulates osteoclast activity, and osteoclasts are the cells that break down our bone. This breakdown of bone then releases calcium into the bloodstream. Parathyroid hormone also works on the kidneys. Here we stimulate the resorption of calcium back into the blood at the renal tubules. And we also signal the release of calcitriol. Our third effect involves calcitriol, where it stimulates calcium absorption in the intestines. 
All three of these effects of parathyroid hormone function to increase our blood calcium levels. This increase in calcitonium, calcitonin, also helps to stimulate the building of bone. So that if we break down bone with lower calcium levels, this eventually causes the secretion of calcitriol, which can then replace that bone that was broken down. Now we'll talk about our adrenal glands, which were located on the kidneys. Our adrenal gland has two main areas, the cortex and the medulla. Within the medulla, we make epinephrine and norepinephrine. These are the catecholamines that function in the sympathetic nervous system to drive that fight or flight response. In the adrenal cortex, we make several steroids, including our glucocorticoids, such as cortisol, our mineralocorticoids, such as aldosterone, and our adrenal androgens. Remember that hormones that are steroid hormones are made from cholesterol. That then means that steroid hormones are hydrophobic or lipophilic. So they have to be bound by a carrier protein in plasma, but they can also pass through the cell membrane, acting on nuclear receptors to regulate gene expression. Cortisol, which is made by the adrenal gland, is our primary stress hormone. Cortisol controls mood, motivation, and fear. It helps increase our fight or flight response. It also has some inflammatory properties where it reduces inflammation. It increases our blood glucose when our blood glucose levels get low. And cortisol controls our sleep-wake cycle. Cortisol is generally considered to be the stress hormone. It is regulated through the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. There are a number of conditions that can cause the release of cortisol. So stressors, pain, infection, um, hemorrhage or trauma or some sort of physiologic injury, surgery, changes in sleep and changes in blood sugar can all signal the release of corticotropic releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. Corticotropic releasing hormone then travels to the anterior pituitary, then signaling the release of adrenocorticotropic hormone. This then travels to the adrenal cortex, signaling the release of cortisol. The release of cortisol can alter our glucose, fat, and protein metabolism and it can also suppress immune responses and inflammation. While it regulates the stress response, cortisol will divert our metabolism from building our tissues to supplying an immediate source of energy for dealing with the stress. So because of this, it will increase our blood glucose. It is cortisol that causes the signs and symptoms we often see of someone who is going through chronic stress. Cortisol has a normal uh, diurnal rhythm for release, for as you start to wake up during the day, um, your cortisol will be at its peak. This will help increase our blood glucose through gluconeogenesis, and it decreases the utilization of glucose by our tissues. It also increases protein and fat metabolism, and it's gonna create a stronger sympathetic nervous system effect on heart rate. It also has an anti-inflammatory effect, and it's often used pharmacologically for that function. As we go throughout the day, cortisol levels normally drop to our lowest in the middle of the night. And then as we wind up and get ready to start our day, those levels will increase again. And finally, let's look at aldosterone. Aldosterone is important for the regulation 
of sodium and potassium concentration in our biologic fluids, including our urine, our sweat, and our saliva. It also regulates our blood levels of these ions. Remember that aldosterone is a key component of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, where aldosterone is released upon production of angiotensin II. Higher levels of aldosterone will increase sodium reabsorption at the kidneys. Wherever sodium goes, water follows, so it also increases water volume, and so it increases blood pressure by expanding our blood volume. At the same time, it can increase excretion of potassium. If you decrease or inhibit aldosterone, you're going to increase excretion of sodium, so you're going to lose sodium and water out through the kidneys into the urine, having a diuretic effect. But it will also uh, decrease the excretion of kidney, so it may increase our blood potassium. This is an overview of key hormones that you will see in human health and disease.